So just to sort of summarize the structure of the webinar, we're going to start off by asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves um, and talk a little bit about what their position is and what they do in their job. Um, and then we'll move on to a Q&A session. Um, so if uh, Christopher, do you want to kick it off? Introduce yourself, um, tell us what office you work in, and a few sentences about what you do in your position. Right. Um, perfect. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, again, so my name is uh, it's Christopher Harvey, and I currently serve as a legislative assistant in Congresswoman Lizzie Fletcher's office. She's a freshman member out of Houston, Texas, uh, first time uh, being in elected office and the uh, first Democrat to serve uh, in Congressional District, Texas. Um, and so in my role, uh, for me as a legislative assistant, um, it's my job, I manage the legislative portfolio. So for me, um, the Congresswoman sits on two congressional committees, Transportation Infrastructure, as well as House Science, Space and Technology Committee. And so in my role, I manage her legislative portfolio on the House Science, Space and Technology Committee uh, specifically with uh, NASA and space issues, as well as uh, immigration, education, housing, uh, financial services, homeland security, small business, and a host of other uh, legislative issues. And it's my job to make sure, one, that I'm uh, constantly briefing the Congresswoman and keeping her up to date on any type of legislative matters or updates that are happening in my specific issue areas, whether that's me writing memorandums, uh, just actually physically sitting down, briefing with her, talking about these issues, meeting with various stakeholders, lobbyists, constituents, um, and doing traveling between the DC office as well as our uh, Houston office where she represents uh, in Texas 7. Great. Um, Marcus, do you want to go next? Yeah, of course. Uh, so again, my name is Marcus Sawyers. Uh, so I'm the special assistant to Congressman John Lewis. Um, my role is a little bit different than Chris's. I'm more on the um, admin operational side. So I deal with a lot of the congressmen's correspondence. Um, I also travel with the congressmen a lot. Um, and then I also do a lot of the day-to-day -day basis scheduling for the congressman um, for his calendar and his weekly agenda uh, from going from there into the committee. Um, he's part of the Ways and Means Committee. So uh, we have a lot of different briefings and uh, committee meetings of that nature. But my role is more just straight operations, uh, scheduling, and also a little bit of financial work as well um, with different stakeholders for the congressman. Awesome. Um, Taylor, do you wanna go next? Sure. Um, so my role is very different. Um, I was a Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Fellow, um, actually specialized in post-secondary education, um, which follows pretty much from college students, um, campus administration, um, financing, and a host of other things. Um, before that, I worked as a fellow and congresswoman on the Adams office from North Carolina's 12th congressional district, um, where I worked predominantly on HBCU issues, which kind of funneled me perfectly um, into my fellowship on the House Committee on Education and Labor. I recently left the, um, the Hill, and I've transitioned onto the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation which is the Congressional Black Caucus's um, 501c3 nonprofit. Basically, I have 55 amazing bosses um, and I work to support their programs. We have a fellowship program of which I'm still a part. We have a leadership institute internship program and we also provide scholarships. Um, and so right now I'm predominantly working on um, supporting our alumni strategy and making sure that as people advance onto the Hill or into public policy, we know where, the folk, where those folks are going um, and how we can make a bigger impact globally. Great. And Clement hasn't been able to join us yet, so we'll have him give his introduction once he's able to do that. Um, but we're going to start off with the first question. Um, so when did you all know that you wanted to work on the Hill and has this always been your dream or is it something you came to later? So I guess I'll, I'll answer for me, um, I actually didn't know I wanted to work on the Hill until um, after um, my senior year of college. So before I was working on the Hill, I used to work for the mayor's office in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, North Carolina. And that's pretty much where I got my political start at. 
um, and working during state level government, state level politics is really what caught my attention. Um, and then after that, she's the one that really opened my eyes into like a new realm of the political world on Capitol Hill, uh, which made me decide like, hey, let me come up to Washington DC and uh, see what this Capitol Hill life is about. Uh, so for, for me, it was definitely um, after my senior year of college that I realized I wanted to work on Capitol Hill after I did my internship on Capitol Hill and saw the day-to-day -day operations, how things went and moved on Capitol Hill. Great. Um, Taylor or Chris, do you have anything different sure. to say about that? Um, yeah, so I, being a kind of a DC local, um, I grew up in Prince George's County, Maryland, which is about 20 minutes outside of DC. Um, I always kind of knew that I wanted to work in policy and wanted to work for federal government. Um, I didn't really know what that would look like for me. And so at age 15, when um, the Hill still had a lot more opportunities for high schoolers, I had the opportunity to work for my congressional representative as an intern. Um, and I loved the environment. Um, I loved being around people that were young, people that were motivated for change, um, and folks who were really experts in their areas. Um, and so when I had the opportunity to come back to the Hill as a fellow, I kind of threw myself into the work and soon realized that I wanted to create more pathways for young people like myself to get into public policy um, and to do really well with it. Um, and so that's kind of what drove me to move into CBCF um, to really create those pathways and strengthen the existing pathways. That's really interesting. Um, okay, so we'll go ahead and move on to our next question. Why do you think your job is awesome, if you do think that it is? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I definitely think that, you know, anyone who has a, um, a service mind um, or has that, you know, the ambition to want to be able to be a part of something bigger than themselves, I think that this is exactly the role that, for me, uh, that I imagine. And, you know, the fact that I get to work on uh, specific policy issues that affect the people that I love and care about back home is a tremendous and awesome feeling. I'm a Houston native, uh, so I'm from Houston, so I get to work for my hometown member. And so that feeling of knowing that every day when I wake up, here I am working on legislation that, you know, um, like I said, people that I love and care about are affected by, it's, it's a different feeling. And so that gives you the energy uh, to wake up every day, get through the day. And it's just something that, you know, for me, I've always wanted to do. And I know you, that was the first question, you know, have you always wanted to work on the Hill? And for me, same thing. Like, you know, back when I was an undergrad, I, and I tell my friends this all the time, like I specifically remember sitting in one of my political science courses, listening to a lecture, and I think I started daydreaming. And I told myself, man, I can't wait. I would love to work on the Hill one day working on policy. And now, I get that opportunity to do that. And so it's just, it's, it's a tremendous feeling. There's so much going on now, uh, especially in this day and age. And, you know, you walk through these doors, you realize where you're at, and it's just like an amazing feeling that, you know, I get the opportunity to help affect uh, some type of change in different uh, issue areas, so. Great. Um, Taylor Marcus, do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, yeah, so for me, um... For me, it's, like I said, I don't work for uh, my hometown representative, but for me, it's just uh, more like an eye-opening thing for me, being able to work for um, Congressman Lewis, uh, somebody that has definitely played a significant role um, in where we are here today. Um, really just super encouragement. Um, I love my job. I love working for him. And every day, every night, even though there might be long hours and uh, things of that nature, that I'm able to travel with him and just learn and grow from him. It's truly a blessing that I love to um, have and something that I always keep and cherish just because, you know, learning from him and working here, he's taught me a lot. And just being able to, you know, as I say, be like the ladder to his shoulders um, is super cool and super great and something that I like to cherish for a while. That's great. Um, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next question. So as staffers, you all must see people coming in and out to meet with the Congress people all the time and always calling the congressmen, asking to talk about issues that are important to them. Do you think that that kind of advocacy really makes a difference in um, sort of affecting change? I would definitely say it makes a world of difference. Um, 
So I had the opportunity during my fellowship to witness the government shutdown of 2018. Um, and in that experience, um, all of our interns were gone in the office. And so it was really time for everyone to do an all hands and effort on answering phone calls. Um, and in that opportunity, we had a gentleman who called from his district um, and was basically telling us his experiences during the shutdown and um, how it was impacting his children, how it was impacting his health care. Um, and so that through that call, I was able to funnel that to the Congresswoman. Um, and we were able to kind of, kind of get the ball rolling on policies um, to either get assistance or to get back pay. Um, so those types of things definitely matter. And then also, when groups come to visit us, um, as staffers, we tend to draft um, memorandum of copious notes for the members to keep them abreast of what's going on in the district, what's going on in the ground. Um, and what goes on on the ground really elevates the conversation to the members' ears. So um, a phone call may seem like a very small thing at the time, but collective phone calls over time definitely have an impact. Um, and those things are what create policy. Great. Chris or Marcus, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so I, I definitely think that having that direct contact between a constituent and a member is super effective. Uh, you know, part of my job duty is meeting with constituents, meeting with stakeholders, uh, sometimes just myself or uh, most of the times meeting with them along with the congresswoman. And I think that one of the, the biggest things that you can do as a constituent, if you're meeting with your member, um, you know, if you're going to talk with them about a particular issue, the fact that you are from the district says a lot. Um, members love to be able to talk with people that are actually from their district. And, you know, whether, you know, you're coming talking about immigration, we've met with a lot of DACA recipients, a lot of TPS recipients, and just kind of just being able to share your thoughts and being able to personalize a lot of these, um, a lot of the policy that we always hear about um, you know, over the news or through the internet, like being able to personalize a lot of those issue areas is super effective and it allows the member to kind of hear directly from people that are impacted by it. And so, you know, um, whether you're calling in, meeting with a member in DC or back home in their district office, I really think that that is a great form of advocacy. And, you know, I would definitely encourage uh, young people, um, you know, to, to do more of that because I think members really like to see that. And we've met with a lot of student groups these past few months and a lot of them have come, you know, it's always been a lot of them when they would come here. And it's just, it's just something that's super effective. And anytime, um, you know, we're working on legislation, the member will always ask like, well, how does this impact the district? Who does this, who, who does this impact in the district? And so having that information will always be vital. Um, so I would definitely encourage people to, uh, to continue advocate, uh, advocating like that. That's great. Um, so a lot of our alumni, and I'm sure a lot of the people watching today are people who might be interested in one day working on the Hill. Um, could each of you share a top tip for someone who's interested in working on Capitol Hill? Yeah, um, so I, I'll say this. So when you think of a Capitol Hill staffer, there are three different areas or three different routes that classify Capitol Hill staffers. You have the legislative route, which is what I'm on. Then you have the communications route. And then you have the operations slash admin route. Um, and so knowing the route that you want to take will help you tremendously because then you were able to kind of focalize on, you know, uh, the people that you're having coffee with and just uh, being able to kind of focus on this is the route that I want to take, you know, if I get on the hill. But it's really important, especially for the people that, you know, are political science majors currently or uh, recent graduates, it's really good to have what I like to call situational awareness. So which means that you understand the politics, the things that you're learning in your political science classes, the, the basic foundation of what politics and policy is and understanding that there's a difference between the two. But in, in the role of a legislative staffer, if you're interested in going the legislative route, you have to be able to understand the difference between the two, but at the same time, you have to know when to apply them. And so I think that's something that's important to really kind of have that basic understanding of how uh, politics and policy work. And then you're able to use, uh, you're able to utilize that in your role. Um, and perfect, uh, perfect example, so as the Congresswoman, she serves in the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee. 
uh, they have jurisdiction over NASA. And so NASA uh, each year has to go up before what we call reauthorization. And so in my role, I have to make sure that the Congresswoman is prepared for that. And so right now I'm currently reading a uh, Inspector General's report from NASA about the current International Space Station and the commercial crew program. And so uh, during these hearings, the members get the chance to ask questions. Well, for me, having that situational awareness, knowing that one, that this NASA reauthorization is getting ready to come up soon, even though the date hasn't been announced, I need to make sure that I'm ready for that. I need to understand the politics behind that. NASA typically has been something, the issue that's been bipartisan. So we know that that's something that, you know, people can rally behind. And then understanding the policy with the fact that if the inspector, the inspector general's report is saying something, maybe I can develop questions uh, for the member to ask during that hearing to get answers to. So just kind of really, again, understanding the difference between politics and policy and being able to tie that all together is something that I would encourage people to do if you're interested in uh, working here on the Hill. Great. Um, Taylor or Marcus, do you have any, any tips for uh, future congressional staffers? Um, so I would definitely say, um, get comfortable and familiar with your home delegation. Um, while not everyone has the opportunity to work for their home member, I think in a lot of interviews, they'll ask you, again, a situational awareness question, kind of what's going on in your district? Um, and I remember very vividly when I went in for my interview, um, I was very young and frankly was not supposed to be um, getting this internship. I was maybe 15. Um, and I remember you had to be like a senior in high school, but because I knew kind of what was going on in the district, um, because I understood how to present the member with her priorities, um, that's what set me above the other applicants. Um, and so definitely understanding like, oh, these are the stakeholders in the district that support my member. These are um, the different groups on the ground that have made noise in the past. Uh, and then these are the issues that my member has been very vocal on. And the, those are the things that I can be passionate about in her office. Um, so for instance, when I chose to work on the Committee on Education and Labor, I've always had a passion for education policy. Um, and specifically, my father attended an HBCU, and so I knew um, as soon as I got there that that's something I wanted to work on. And so I really did my research on what policies were affecting that. Is it funding? Is it civil rights policy? Um, so just kind of knowing what areas touch um, each policy is super important and sets you apart. That's great. That's really good advice. Marcus, do you have anything to add? No, so I would just add, just to piggyback off of both of them, it's just really just know, just have an open ear and just be willing to learn because uh, on Capitol Hill and just in life in general, there's just so many people that, um, there's so many people on Capitol Hill that just do their job well, you know, and so always just have that open ear to learn and just be able to, like, if you want to do legislative route, be willing to learn everything about the legislative side that you can. If you want to do the operation route, be willing to learn everything about the operation side or the communication side so you can get to fully grasp you know, the understanding of what actually goes on on a day-to-day -day basis on Capitol Hill. And then only from there, you can really just grow up the ladders on Capitol Hill. Uh, if whether you're starting on the Senate side, on the House side, or you know, even just making your way off to another executive branch, but just being willing to learn and just have an open ear um, is really uh, what I think is like key to being on Capitol Hill. Great. Um, so the next question, Chris, I'm going to direct it towards you. So I know that you got um, a grad degree. Do you think that that's something that's necessary to work on Capitol Hill? Um, sort of what made you decide that that was something you wanted to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, you know, every and every everyone's path uh, when you're on the hill or even just getting on the hill, everyone's path is going to be different. And so for me, um, you know, I started on the hill last year as an intern uh, back in January 2018. And by then I was already in graduate school. Um, and so I really felt that I just wanted to enhance my experience. And I, you know, I chose a, a, specific, a, a specific graduate program. Uh, George Washington University, the Graduate School of Political Management in their legislative affairs track. And what attracted me to the program was that they focused on the practical skills. Um, so it wasn't really theory-based, but actually 
teaching you, showing you how to do legislative research and analysis, how to write uh, a policy memo, how to write co-sponsorship memos or vote recommendations, things that you're actually learning in class, you're able to apply the very next day because that's what you're doing, you know, for your full-time job. And our professors, the best part, the professors are practitioners. So these are people who are former chiefs of staffs, former legislative directors, staff directors of congressional committees that are teaching you these skills that congressional staffers need. And so for me, it helped me enhance um, enhance my abilities and to make, I guess, to make me more marketable for, when, you know, when I was applying to different offices at that point when I was an intern. Um, so I definitely think for me, uh, it helped me out. Um, but again, I want to say that with the caveat that everyone's path is going to be different. For some people, some people may not need graduate degrees because they already have years of experience. I think that's one of the biggest things that we see here a lot on the Hill. When you have a good number of years of experience, that, that carries a lot of weight. Yes, the graduate degree can help supplement that and, you know, make you stand out. Um, but that's just, I think uh, having that graduate degree is going to be a personal decision, for, obviously, for everyone. But for me, I, that was uh, the route that I decided to take. And, it, you know, it, it helped me out. Um, you know, this was the first year serving in a role like this for me and, you know, doing budget and appropriations. Um, at the beginning of the year, um, I took a class. I remember it was on the uh, uh, politics of budgetary politics. And in the class, we're learning the intricacies and mechanisms of the budget process, the politics and the policy behind it. And so when I was doing it here in the office, it was easy for me to kind of follow along with a lot of the directives I was getting from my legislative director because I took that class. And so I knew what was going on because I had situational awareness and that background of how this process worked. And it made it easier for me to kind of do my job. And so I think that was a, for me, a vindication that, that my master's degree was being was being put to good use because it's, it made my job easier and it allowed me to be more efficient. So, great, that's really good advice. And Clement, I think I just saw that you joined. Oh, well, maybe not. Um, okay, uh, so we'll go no, ahead sorry. and. Oh, okay. Um, hi, Clement. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so could you go ahead and um, introduce yourself, like, tell us what office you work in, and then tell us in a couple of sentences what you do in your position? Sure. Um, and, you know, my apologies to everyone. I was just... with uh, the chairwoman that's going to work for. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Clement Labonte Jr. Um, I work in for all matters related to financial services and uh, insurance, as well as international uh, financial institutions. Uh, my job title leader, and in that role, I am a bit of a jack of all trades, uh, but primarily I track our member priorities. I uh, are whip our bills that we are moving through the committee and on the floor. Um, I ensure that you know members are you know, getting your priorities recognized and, and ensuring that they're what's important to them is moving through the through the committee as well as um, conveying the chairwoman's priorities to members and to other uh, interested stakeholders. Great, thank you so much, and thank you so much again for joining us today. Um, okay, of course, so yeah. we'll happy to be here. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and move on to our next question. Um, which of your past experiences has been the most valuable in your work on Capitol Hill? For me, I would definitely say uh, when I was working for um, the mayor of Charlotte, um, like I said from the beginning, she's the one that really gave me my footsteps into the political world um, because I actually was a criminal justice major and um, business major and minor in sociology. So I didn't really have the whole political science route. So me working for the mayor and getting that job um, in Charlotte, she really introduced me um, to the political world and just showed me the route. Um, and being, like I said, being with her all the time, um, she was the one that introduced me to the policy side and the operation side and the communication world. Um, so working for her, she's really set my, um, I guess you say backbone into the political world and where I'm at today would definitely be um, through her. 
I'd yeah, have okay. to say, um, for my, well. Go ahead, Colin. Yeah, thanks. Uh, for myself, it was um, an internship I had um, when I was in community college in Connecticut. I was interning for the Connecticut, uh, at the Connecticut State uh, General Assembly, the state legislature. That was my first foray into politics and understanding um, what, what it takes for bills to become a law. So at the time I was interning for the then state uh, House Majority Leader, who, you know, the Majority Leader is the one who maintains the legislative schedule uh, you know, in the legislative body and working for him and interning, uh, interning for him and learning, you know, what it takes to ensure that members of a certain uh, political bloc vote a certain way or understanding what compromises or concessions need to be made when you're negotiating legislative packages. Um, it gave me a, a real strong appreciation for the work that uh, members do as well as the work that staff do. Um, and, you know, at, at that time I was studying finance. I thought I was going to go work on Wall Street or something. But um, yeah, the, the appreciation and love I, got, I had of the political process was strengthened during that internship. And I, I definitely think for me, and just like Marcus, um, I received my start in local government. Um, I spent three years working for a county commissioner back home in Texas, uh, in Fort Bend County. And so, you know, I really got a chance to see how specifically policy is implemented on the local level because what a lot of people don't realize is that a lot of the policy that's crafted here in DC is up to the county, it's up to a lot of county governments, local governments to implement that in the area that they're in. And so for me, that was a great eye-opening experience that I think that helped me kind of truly understand the whole um, term of federalism, um, federal, state, and local governments working together. And then I would also say my time working, I had a presidential campaign experience uh, working on then uh, presidential candidate Hillary Clinton in uh, Wisconsin in 2016. And I think those skills, uh, those interpersonal skills and time management skills that you learn working on a presidential campaign, working seven days a week all day, is something that's very transferable here on the Hill because, you know, while you're not working directly with voters, you're working with constituents. And, you know, especially as you start on the Hill and those entry level roles, like having interpersonal skills is important because you're talking with people all day, whether they're walking in the office or they're calling you on the phone, that, those are important skills that I think that helped me, um, you know, when I arrived on the Hill. Great. So at this point, we're going to open it up to questions um, from the viewers watching. Um, so if anyone has a question that they want to ask, um, go ahead and turn on um, your microphone and go ahead and ask it. Um, so I can start. Hi, my name is Tani and I am a recent uh, alum of the Global Youth Program. Um, it was really incredible and I mean just an incredible experience and I'm so lucky to have been there. Um, right now I am a senior in high school and I'm about to graduate which is really exciting. Um, I have um, chosen to go to a school in Kentucky. And my first question is um, mainly just for everyone here, like how do I as a student who is like, um, you know, very, like I have, you know, liberal values and I really want to, you know, get involved in things that are pushing, you know, the agenda of, you know, civil rights and like environmental justice, things like that. How do I get involved in such a historically red state, I guess? So, I would definitely say um, start with your campus organizations. Those are a great platform where you can kind of build out the agenda um, and enforce it from ground up. Um, and so I was president of the Black Student Union when I was at, when I was an undergrad at Penn State. Um, and so we were really able to craft um, a full agenda at the time. Um, I think my junior and senior year was the time of the Michael Brown shooting. Um, and the Trayvon Martin shooting. And so we kind of created a whole agenda around um, Black Lives Matter, police brutality education, um, and just making sure that students felt like they were a part of the conversation. Um, and so that kind of looked like bringing in Trayvon and Martin's mom, um, letting her have a conversation with students, bringing in, um, we kind of had a facilitator to lead a course on um, how to interact with police on campus. Um, and so it really gives you the opportunity to organically create um, what the agenda is while also informing yourself on like what the issues are. 
and also I'll just say, you know, um, even if they don't have it, maybe uh, I think you said Kentucky, you know, feel free to start it at your um, school yourself. You know, always, it's always good for somebody to take the lead um, because I'm sure there might be other people that may want to do the same thing and you can be the one that um, actually maybe starts something to add a little bit more blue to the red state or of that nature. So like if you want to start maybe the, you know, Young Democrats of America um, at your college campus or um, in the local community there, that's always good because like um, the congressman says it all the time um, that the young people will be the future uh, in the next generation. So being able to get the early start, being able to, you know, find something that you're passionate about it. Um, and being, being from, I worked on like campus activity board when I was in uh, undergrad and uh, I'm sure your university, that's what they want. They want students to get involved. They want students to get the most from the university. So go to your uh, um, student body president or whoever handles over the student body and say that, hey, I have this idea for a club that I want to start to bring other like-minded individuals together so we can see difference in this area. And I'm sure that you can only grow from there. So I'll definitely keep that an option if that's something they don't already have. Always think about being the president or CEO of it or find out in it yourself to you know get a better start at it. Great, that's really great advice. Um, does anyone else have any other questions that they're interested in asking our panelists? Yeah, I have a question for Chris. Um, I am also a senior in high school and this summer I'm looking at, um, or I want to get an internship. Um, I'm asking you this, Chris, because I'm also from Houston. And um, yeah, um, so I was wondering if you have any advice for landing a beneficial internship yeah, uh, definitely. I, I think that, you know, when you, and depending on, you know, what your, uh, your political affiliation is, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, I really think that you should definitely um, start by reaching out to the offices that, you know, that you affiliate with. So if you're a Democrat, you know, you have obviously uh, Congresswoman Lizzie Fletcher and Congresswoman uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia, Congressman Al Green, um, you know, within the Houston area, or if you're a Republican, you have Congressman Dan Crenshaw, or Congressman Randy Weber, or Congressman Brian Babin. So it's, I would definitely say it's important to kind of start in the area that you feel that you lean towards, um, because it's really important, especially working on the Hill, that you know that I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat. There's no, there's no such thing as being, uh, I'm in between, like, you need to know where you stand, because that's important, because um, that's, that's a question that can come up. Um, so I would definitely start, you know, reaching out to your local offices, um, seeing one, um, you know, do they have internships for high school students? Um, I know some offices do, um, you know, that that's always a great start. And like now is the time where people are looking for internships for the spring. Um, so that's definitely um, something that I would uh, take notice of um, as, a, as a current uh, high school student. Perfect. Thank you. All right, does anyone else have any questions that they're interested in asking? I have a couple questions. Hi, is my mic working? Yes, it's working now. Okay, so I have a couple questions. Um, hi, I'm Cynthia. I'm from the Chicago metropolitan area near the south side. Um, so specifically for Clement, I know you talked about like the organization of like the floor and recognizing speakers. So how is that different from like the chair, or, like the presiding officer that like, that's the path that you take there? Could you, <clears throat> I'm sorry, could you uh, maybe, maybe um, share a little bit more, I'm trying to better understand your question. Are you asking, um, why I decided to, to pursue, you know, a career on the committee? No, like, so with what you were saying you do while you're there in the meetings, like recognizing speakers and stuff. So how is that like different than the like presiding officer or chair? Are they one and the same when it's like in a committee meeting? 
I think so. What, what uh, my function, especially when we're in committee uh, hearings or, or markups, is to help facilitate the process and the procedures of, of said hearing and markup. And so, you know, if there's a member that, you know, wants to ask a question or, you know, let, let's say during a markup, for example, a member saying, oh, you know, I have this amendment that I want to offer, you know, when's the right time to do it? What I'm doing is I'm facilitating that conversation between uh, them and the chairwoman, if needed, or just explaining them the rules and the, and the procedure and process. Sometimes members, you know, they, there's a lot that they have to do during the day, so they may not always remember the, the nuances of the, of the rules in, in one committee versus another committee that they may be on versus the House floor as a whole. And so my job is just to ensure that they, um, you know, are aware and understand our process and to answer any questions that, that they have. And um, if it gets to a point where I need to elevate it to the chairwoman, I'll do that and, you know, explain that the situation to the chairwoman. Um, but for the most part, I'm, I'm facilitating and ensuring that the process moves uh, as smooth as possible. So like with the amendments, are you the one who's saying whether or not they're like germane or dilatory or is it your job to more like convey that to the chair? Um, so that 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 stuff plays out um, in the weeks leading up to a markup. And so generally, um, you know, when amendments are coming from your side of the aisle, so I'm a, I'm a Democrat, the one there are democratic amendments. Those are never going to be dilatory. You know, we work with these offices to ensure that the amendments will, will get the support that they need, fit the policy so that way they are germane, um, and so that there are the, the votes that are needed to adopt the amendment. It can happen with, uh, you know, uh, minority amendments that come that may be dilatory. Um, and for those amendments, every committee has a parliamentarian that will help the chairwoman decide on what is germane, what is not germane, what is dilatory, if it is a dilatory amendment, what is the strategy and the procedure that we will engage in to ensure that we can stop the dilatory practices and continue with the business of the committee. Um, so for the more parliamentarian type of stuff that you're talking about, there is a person with that knowledge and, and that title who's responsible for advising the chairwoman on parliamentary matters. Thank you. My, my job is, is, is a more uh, political one in terms of, you know, are there votes? Will members like this? Who's going to have opposition? That type of stuff. All right, Karen, did you have a question that you wanted to ask? Karen, I think you're on me still. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here I am. Can you hear me here? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. I joined by my phone as well. Um, my question is, in this climate of such... gives you hope for our having a good sound democratic process and good debate and honest exploration of issues. You know, what, what makes you think that it doesn't always have to feel or be this way? Hey, Karen, could you, could you repeat that question? Because I think the first half cut off and I, I didn't hear the first half of it. Sure, I apologize. My computer speed's not great. That's why I was trying to, to go by phone. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Okay, so in this, this time of, of great polarization, so it feels to all of us not working on the Hill, uh, what gives you hope that it won't always be that way? You know, that we, we do still have a good, strong process and we can debate issues honestly and openly. You know, what makes you think that our, our system will endure whatever kind of temporary, um, you know, feelings of dividedness we may be experiencing? Yeah. I, I definitely think that's a great question. Um, I, you know, a lot of times when, you know, if you're, you're watching the news, you always see the partisan, the partisanship all the time. But what a lot of people don't see, there, are a lot, there is a lot of legislation that is being passed on a bipartisan basis. And I think that that's something that's important. There, there are things that are getting done, um, you know, here, you know, on the Hill, despite impeachment despite you know everything else that's been going on I think that that is something that is very um, hopeful 
um, you know, a lot of times, like, you know, there, and the, there are a lot of members, while it may not look like that on camera, they're working together behind the scenes to get stuff done. Um, you know, and that's just, it just goes to show you that, you know, there is still hope. And with the staffers, I mean, you know, a lot of, a lot of Democratic staffers are friends with Republican staffers. Like, we all end up going to the same receptions at the end of the day or working together at other functions. And so, I mean, there is, there is the capacity there to show that it's not all what a lot of times you'll see on the news. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, just a, it's just a situation what we're in now. But I think that more so the younger generation, millennial generation and younger, like the people that, you know, will be the future, um, I don't think is as, um, it's not as partisan as we see it with the older generation. Uh, so. And I would just piggyback off of that. Yeah, I, mean, um, I think my time on committee you know, definitely showed me just how collegial the members are with each other. Um, it's actually quite comical to watch through a full markup um, with how they refer to each other. And when they say my good friend from the state of da 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 da, they really mean that. Um, the members are very genuine. They talk to each other off hours. A lot of them have dinner with each other. Um, and as Chris kind of said, with the staffers, um, at least I know on my committee, um, we made a point to meet with our Republican counterparts um, pretty regularly, and we had really good productive discussions. Um, and so when it comes down to these markups, the issues that you kind of see these big disagreements on, um, I feel like they're a lot fewer and more far between than they're uh, depicted. depicted. Um, but we do have a lot of issues that we come together on. Um, and I've had the privilege to see that especially play out in education. Um, when we are marking up the, um, our recent bill, um, a lot of the members came together um, with consensus around a myriad of issues um, and we only had one or two where there was just a lot of tension. Um, and so I think you come to a, a place where you see most members agree with the solutions to the problem. Um, it's a matter of how we implement that, what mechanisms, what strings to pull, things of that nature. Great. That's all really great commentary. Does anyone else have any questions that they want to ask our panelists? Um, I have oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, you can go. Okay, um, I just wanted to ask a quick question. Um, like, a lot of you guys talked about how you started off in Capitol Hill or like at Capitol Hill as like, um, you know, high schoolers or like undergraduate students and stuff like that. Um, as young people, do you think that you felt like prepared and welcomed at Capitol Hill or was there like a different internal experience? Um, <laughs> I don't mind taking that first. Um, so my first experience, again, I was very, very young. Um, and so I don't want to taint your view of internships. Um, but I feel like the staff were definitely willing to mentor me, but I also had to come with the mind of what I wanted to be mentored in. Um, and so when we talk about knowing which party you kind of want to be a part of, knowing um, whether you want to be on policy side, whether you want to do the admin track, those things kind of help so that staffers can have a better and clearer idea of like, okay, she wants to do the more admin pathway. Let me introduce her to the different staff assistants on the Hill. Let me get her um, in tune with the, con the member's schedule versus if I wanted to do the policy side, they would teach me about how to navigate um, the research centers, how to navigate the Library of Congress. Um, but I've been really privileged to have great mentors um, and even in my transition off of the hill, my mentors have supported me all the way um, and remain great connections for me to get back if I ever so choose to. Yeah, and um, for me, um, I would say I wasn't prepared um, for mm -hmm. real life uh, because I spent my whole time doing um, criminal justice, reviewing like business law contracts and planning for that route. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't prepare yourself when you're here. Like, like she was saying, there's so many different ways and opportunities where you can just, you know, broaden your learning while you're here at the same time. Um, like Chris was talking about earlier, he was going to his um, graduate classes and learning stuff that he was learning in class and just implementing in his day-to-day -day work here on Capitol Hill. Um, as long and just, just like she was saying, just having like mentorship and people that's willing here to help you grow um, there's so many people on Capitol Hill that would best invest time in you 
if you're willing to get the time invested into you. Um, so just being willing to just go out here and just learn as much as you can. Um, for me, when I was intern on Capitol Hill, um, I tried to be with the congressman as much as I can, no matter if it was like a event, uh, briefing, you know, as much as I could shadow the congressman and the chief of staff um, when, while I was interning. Um, that was really crucial to me because they also showed me the foundation of like how the day-to-day -day office of commercial office runs and um, policy working of that nature. So if you come into it and you see if you get an internship and you don't know every single thing about political science because maybe you didn't major in political science in undergrad or maybe you just didn't get the full grasp experience while you was in undergrad about political science, um, it doesn't mean that you can't learn that while you're here. Uh, you just got to be invested in your experience and be willing to learn. And like I was telling you earlier, just have an open ear so that you can apply everything that you learn on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, day -day basis because things move quick here on Capitol Hill um, and just apply it to the next day and the next day and the next month and the next year just to build on top of your resume, your portfolio. Thank you. Um, all right, so we're going, we have time for one more audience question. Um, so ideally someone who hasn't asked a question yet. Um, Hi, um, I had a question. Uh, my name is Magna and I'm from California. And um, I remember that earlier you guys were mentioning that there were different paths that you could take. And like you recently mentioned it too. So I believe you said uh, legislative, communicative and um, more administrative. So I was wondering, how did you um, find out in the beginning which ones you were more interested in? Because you did mention that it's better to go in knowing what you'd like to do. So were you able to like try them out or did you have to just like um, figure that out beforehand? Yeah, I would definitely say that one of the good things, um, so let's say you start out as an intern here on the Hill. As an intern, you're going to be doing a bunch of everything. So you're definitely going to be doing a lot of things uh, on the legislative side, on the communication side, and on the operation uh, slash admin side. And so for a lot of people, that's when they kind of figure out like, hey, I really enjoy uh, working with the press secretary. I really enjoy, you know, working on um, research and press uh, information for this uh, press release uh, for the communications director. I think I want to do comms. Like, you know, or I enjoy working with the legislative team or, you know, I enjoy working with the scheduler because, you know, I like how they, how the offices run. So like, as an intern, you, you'll get that opportunity to kind of like really kind of figure out what route that you want to take. For some people, they already come in as intern knowing the route that they want to take, but for some, they have to, you know, experience it first. And so I think there, there's plenty, there's plenty of time uh, to get that figured out. And that's why I think a lot of people advocate being an intern and all of us here on the panel started on the Hill as interns. And I think that that experience um, really helped us out in kind of determining like, you know, this is the route that I want to take. Um, so um, don't, don't think that if, you know, I don't have it figured out now that it's going to hinder you. No, um, that interns do everything. So you'll have that opportunity to really kind of decide, like, I want to go this route compared to another one. And also, I think a beautiful thing about the Hill is that there's a certain level of fluidity within positions. Um, obviously, if you know that you're passionate about one particular area of the office operation, definitely go for that. Um, but I've been able to mentor in my fellowship a lot of interns who kind of thought at one point that they wanted to go more admin route, and that's what their resumes reflected. And then they realized, oh, wait, I really love this one policy area. Um, and so we've been able to work through their resumes and making sure that that's what's communicated through their resume. Um, so for instance, I talked with a young man and he wanted to go the staff assistant route, uh, which is typical um, of a lot of interns is that they'll go from internship to a staff assistant or scheduler position. And then he realized um, the congressman was working on some really great policies around transportation. Um, and so he said, Taylor, can you help me to revise my resume? I really want to go the ledge route. And so we walked him through um, the different experiences that he had during that staff assistant work to be on that resume. Um, and so that looked like taking constituent phone calls for um, the train services in the area, taking meetings with kind of the stakeholders in those areas. So there's definitely a certain level of fluidity and you can figure it out as you go. All right, thank you so much. 
So we're going to kick it off with, um, or finish it off with our last question. I'm going to ask that each of the panelists tell us what you think the best part and what the most challenging part of working on Capitol Hill is. So, oh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I can. Go ahead, Mark. You can. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, um, I, um, let's see. I'll start. The, the best part for me um, in my role, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to, to get a behind the scenes view of legislation that's made in policy making. Um, and, and so, the best part is really seeing how ideas can bubble up from the ground and influence members of Congress. Uh, through you know advocacy advocacy groups through stakeholders, uh, oftentimes the committee will hold <clears throat> excuse me field hearings and roundtables in members districts and just you know truly see how ideas um, are formed and developed at a at a local level maybe somewhere out in Missouri or California or you know we had a field hearing in uh, in Houston Texas and how these ideas can make their way back to Washington D C and and strongly influence policy that you know truly affects people uh, for the better um so that, that's a positive thing and, and that's one thing that excites me about going to work is is knowing that you know the ideas that that we're putting up on the board are ideas that you know come are sourced from around the country they are ideas that are going to impact people and make their lives better um one of the challenges uh, and this is a balancing act is taking these ideas and then putting it through the lens of, okay, what is it that, that we can do right now versus what is it that, you know, is, is something that we just want to message out there. Um, there, are, there are times where, you know, there's an idea that, that we want to pass a bill on and, 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 you know, get this into law, but the realities of, of life here on, on Capitol Hill are, you know, are there votes for it? Is there something that fits in with the, you know, political um, message of our, our leadership? And so it, it's really a balancing act and taking these really great ideas, some of them are, you know, they could be super progressive, they could be moderate, whatever they may be, but taking the idea and then weighing it against, you know, what is it that we can really do in the committee? What is it that the chairwoman is really able to, to legislate on? Um, and then going back to these folks who are bringing us these amazing ideas and, you know, either telling them this is something that we can work on or fortunately this is something that, you know, we may have to, to, to look at in the future. Um, so, you know, the benefits are those great ideas, but then just balancing it against just practical uh, reality of what is it that we can actually do. So, I personally, um, I'm a big relationship person. Um, and so the main thing that I love about the Hill is really getting to see the members' personalities. Um, I don't think that any news broadcast does any member justice with showing um, just how kind hearted they are, how sincere they are, and how passionate they are about the work that they do. Um, working with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation now, like I said, I have 55 bosses, um, all members of the CBC, which has been a great experience. Um, but those members are passionate about what they do, be it education, be it um, be it finance, whatever that is, they have that passion and it really fuels you to want to do the work um, and to rally behind them. Um, I think one of the challenges for me um, was kind of just learning the full breadth of the legislative process. And I think that every staffer learns more and more every day. Um, you have committee staffers educating the office, the, personal office staffers, you have personal office staffers telling committee staffers what the members like. Um, and so there's always something more to learn to make your job easier, better, more difficult. Um, and so definitely coming into that, I won't know everything mentality, but that's okay, um, was a big challenge for me. Um, for me, I would say the best part is really just, you know, for us, um, Congressman Lewis represents uh, the fifth district of Georgia. Um, and just being able to help the people um, back in Georgia and Atlanta is something that's truly great. Uh, people are very thankful and cherished when they're able to come to D.C. and, you know, sit with the congressman and have their concerns and questions answered. Uh, so that's really being able to be a part of those meetings and just see that. 
um, really um, is really a good part for me um, being on Capitol Hill um, that I would like to say. Um, there's really no worse part, I feel like, for me, uh, besides maybe pulling some late hours, but knowing those hours are definitely worth, uh, worth the while sometimes. Um, so, yeah. Um, yes, I, I would definitely say that, and I, th and I think uh, Taylor mentioned this earlier in the panel that, you know, for a lot of people, they come to the Hill knowing that, hey, I'm passionate about this particular issue area. Um, and I think that when you're in the office and you get to work on that issue area, um, it provides you a level of energy and a level of enthusiasm that makes you want to go that extra mile. Like, for example, I, back home in Houston, one of my good friends is a DACA recipient. And I handle immigration issues here for the Congresswoman. And, you know, it, it's, it's something that I knew coming in that that is, that is one of the issue areas that I wanted to work in. And so given what we see that's been going on with immigration, it's just like, okay, I get a chance to actually be an advocate for that and actually working on issues that, you know, surround that. And so it's a really good feeling. And I think I agree with what Clement said. Um, he touched on it about the, that balancing act, like, you have the policy, but sometimes the politics, the politics that come with it kind of stalls things. Like, you know, you have to see like, you know, what, what type of support you're getting. Like, is this something that, is this, is this something that's going to play well back home? What does leadership think about it? Like, and I think that that can be kind of, especially for something that's so important and affects so many people, it can be discouraging at times uh, where you see legislation get stalled when you feel like this is something that Oh, this is something that everyone can agree with. Um, so that, that can be that can be a little um, a little dis um, uh, can make you feel a little like okay, nothing's getting done. But I think that for the most part, the good outweighs the bad. And I have to agree with Marcus. There are a lot of long nights, um, you know, and you know you want to be able to enjoy your evenings and things. But you know, it's like man, you <laughs> you realize I'm gonna have to stay an extra two, three hours. And it's like, you're looking at your clock and it's already like 8.30, sometimes even 9 p.m. And for a lot of people, a lot later than that. Um, so just kind of just being able to balance all of that. But I think at the end of the day, again, um, being here is an honor and an extreme privilege. And I think for all of us that, you know, that is what gets us, you know, through each day, knowing that what we're doing, um, you know, is help is going to help people. And you know it's 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 satisfying, and so I think that's something that's important. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today, and especially to our panelists. Thank you so much for spending your time to come share your experience and expertise with us. I think we've all learned a lot from what you've had to share, and I think it was a really valuable experience. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate how grateful we are that um, you were willing to join us today. Yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, happy thank to be here. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. And um, just a reminder to everyone watching that we have been recording this webinar and we will be posting it on our social media so that if you were maybe not able to join um, right when we started or you want to go and refer back to what our panelists had to say, um, you'll be able to do that. And we should be getting that up in the next week or so. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us and have a great rest of your evening. Awesome. Good night. Everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night.